In The Mysterious Origins of Man, we examined archaeological evidence which directly contradicts many of our accepted theories about the history of man on Earth. Modern human artifacts have been found in all layers of geological strata, some going back hundreds of millions of years. Footprints of man were found side by side with dinosaur tracks. There is no conclusive evidence to prove that man evolved from apes. An ancient city high in the mountains of Bolivia may have been built by an advanced culture unknown to history. The theory of crustal displacement could explain the mystery of the Ice Ages and the disappearance of Atlantis. In this companion tape, our groundbreaking experts will present new material in an open dialogue, free from the constraints of network television. Plus, a radical theory which suggests that the mystery of man's origins may be linked to beings from another world. In their book, Forbidden Archaeology, Michael Cremo and Dr. Richard Thompson uncovered numerous cases which suggest that modern man could be millions of years older than history tells us. Well, we called our book Forbidden Archaeology because we wanted to take people on a tour of the locked rooms in the museums of human history. According to most standard accounts, human beings like ourselves have only been around 100,000 years or so, but the evidence that we catalog in forbidden archaeology takes human history back tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years. I could briefly recount one interesting uh, story that we uncovered. It's the story of a uh, discovery of a bola stone. A bola stone is a uh, stone with a groove cut in it. Uh, a leather thong is tied to that and it's used for, for throwing to, to capture animals. So this bola stone was found embedded in the surface of a cliff in South America. Uh, the rock of that cliff dated to about two to three million years ago. So the, the man who made the discovery knew that there would be skepticism if he announced something like this. So he left the stone in place, just barely showing on the surface of the cliff, and he got several prominent uh, experts in uh, geology and archaeology to gather there. And in front of these experts, he then chipped the stone out of the cliff. The experts verified that the stone of that cliff really would be what's called Pliocene, dating to two to three million years ago. And they saw him chip it out. They saw that it was actually embedded in the rock. And they saw that it was actually a man-made object. So what do you think then was the, the result? Did people then accept uh, scientifically that Man must have existed two to three million years ago in South America? No, not at all. Uh, a, one of the, the authorities who was there wrote in his report that, well, it may be that somehow he hoaxed the, the find. Uh, he may have uh, dug a hole in the cliff and prepared a cement that looked just like the rock, cemented the bowl of stone in place, and, and fooled us all. So in this way, the evidence then was dismissed. In the 1970s, Mary Leakey, it's the wife of Louis Leakey, who was one of the greatest anthropologists of the century, found at a place called Leitoli in Kenya, a set of modern human footprints in volcanic ash that was dated to be three million years old. Now this is quite extraordinary because According to standard views, human beings like ourselves are only about 100,000 years old. So to find these footprints, which are no different than the footprints you would find on a beach today in ash that's three million years old is quite extraordinary. Unfortunately, the mindset of the scientist who looked at these prints was such that they could not reach the obvious conclusion that the beings who made these footprints, which are exactly like ours, must have been very much like us. The only thing that they could say is that 
Whoever was around at that time, whatever type of ape man was around at that time, must have had very human-like feet, which is something that's not borne out by the fossil evidence because the bones, the foot bones they have of the ape men, the Australopithecines, they're called, who lived at that time, do not match those prints. It's perfectly possible you could have uh, modern type humans also living at that time. In 1966, Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre was commissioned to date a collection of spear points found in Huayatlaco, Mexico. The artifacts were expected to be less than 20,000 years old. But when geological tests pointed to the astonishing age of 250,000 years, Dr. McIntyre was faced with a dilemma. The current theory is that humans have been in the New World, which is North and South America, for 10, 20,000 years, no more than that. Our evidence shows that modern man has been in the New World 250,000 years, and they just cannot accept that theory. It blows their mind. Back in 1973, when we went public with the dates, I was sitting pretty. I had a, a good career going in my specialty, which was volcanic ash studies. I had an international reputation, and uh, groups such as NATO and the Amer American Academy of Sciences were paying my way to different meetings abroad to give talks. I had a part-time job with a government agency, one that I thought would lead to better things. I, and later, I became a a professor, or an adjunct professor at one of the state universities in Colorado, and I had a broad um, correspondence with scientists both in the North America and abroad. That's all changed now. <laughs> I ran across one scientist, a European scientist, who was working in the area at the same time. He was a young uh, uh, geologist, as I was, and um, he was, I think, probably working on his degree. And he came up to me and said, Ginger, I believe that the dates are, as you say, they are as old as you say, 250,000 years, but my professor will not let me say this. And uh, I understood his position and uh, realized that he would have to um, lie, essentially, about, about his information in order to keep a job. This man uh, uh, published the lie and was accepted and is now a professor in one of the European universities. I published the truth. I w it wasn't accepted and now I'm doing flowers. While excavating a ravine near Puebla, Mexico, the late archeologist Juan Armenta made a parallel discovery. He found a broken spear point embedded in the jawbone of a prehistoric animal, dating to 260,000 years ago. At the time I was very young. Reporters were coming from all over the world to investigate my father's discovery. It was considered very important not only for the town of Puebla, but for the whole country. But as soon as the first stories were published in Life, Time, and National Geographic magazines, the authorities claimed it was impossible that the artifacts could be so ancient. So they set out to discredit my father, and everything changed. It wasn't only that they questioned his honor. They forbid him to go to the site of the discovery and denied him the right to continue working in his field. They even went to the site with guns and tried to make the workers sign papers saying they planted the artifacts. But out of 60 men, only three of them signed the false confessions. It was very sad for my father, and I think it was the death of a very bright scientist. Even in the scientific community, evidence that doesn't fit the accepted paradigm can get buried in layers of academic literature. In doing our research, it was very interesting. Uh, what we did was we followed a trail of footnotes backwards into the literature. And we would find in a recent book maybe one footnote referring to a given body of evidence, and it would be very dismissive just saying that this was some kind of nonsense. Then you go back and look up the references that that refers to. And then you find a somewhat more elaborate statement saying that this was nonsense. Then you go back to another layer, and you find uh, perhaps a whole book, which is the authoritative dismissal of those findings. Then you go back to an even earlier layer, and you'll find many different books, uh, papers, and so forth, uh, giving the positive evidence and uh, presenting it in a very serious way. 
you won't find these reports in the current textbooks because they go against the ideas of human evolution that later developed. Some people think that you can just publish this information, this uh, uh, information that's controversial, in a scientific publication, and then everyone would know about it, and we'd go down from there. But that's not how it works. It's like a closed system. Um, you can't publish unless you're part of a university or a research stamp establishment because the um, magazines, uh, scientific magazines, won't accept your stuff. But you can't be part of the research establishment if you're something so controversial that they might get a little hassle from some of their alumni or uh, might get some bad publicity. And so you're outside the system. You might want to get the information out, um, but you're not going to do it. The main outcome that we would like to see uh, from our publication of uh, Forbidden Archaeology is that we would like to see an opening up of our serious scientific inquiries into the nature and origin of human beings and also other forms of life. Uh, we feel that the uh, mainstream scientific position on these questions has been too narrowly constricted for a very long period of time. Much important evidence has been left out of the, the picture, and many important ideas have also been excluded. We would like to see a much deeper uh, investigation into all of the available evidence. Dr. Bao has uncovered human footprints and a fossilized human finger in the same strata as dinosaur tracks. But even more mysterious is the discovery of an ancient iron hammer whose chemical makeup confounds scientific laboratories. We have a man-made artifact that was found deposited in central Texas in the very same layer with the dinosaur footprints and the dinosaur remains. It's a man-made hammer with a portion of the handle still intact. Now this hammerhead turns out to be 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulfur, and 2.6% chlorine. Now that's a very exotic blend. I've spoken with a number of physicists, the heads of uh, numerous laboratories, and uh, it's impossible to fabricate that metal today, that is chlorine compounded with iron in metallic form. Now a portion of the handle is coalified. That means there had to be heat and pressure and some time involved in this. You can't make coal, you can't generate coal just by throwing these materials out. There has to be the compression of the entire layer there has to be the generation of some heat in order to coalify the material, even in a rapid form. If the hammer just fell into a crevice, there is no process that could have coalified a portion of the handle. That means it was placed there at the time the rock hardened and cured. I've had various associates investigate the entire area. I've been over the area numerous times. They have found a portion of the bedding plane, the actual layer of rock itself, totally identical to the material of the concretion. Now, dinosaur footprints are found within the immediate vicinity. And then you have layers of rock above this bedding plane that are higher still that do not have dinosaur remains in them. But the material that's consistent with the concretionary material around the implement are all in the lower bedding plain area where the dinosaur remains are. Our evidence uh, is an accumulation of data. We have series of human footprints, isolated footprints, series of dinosaur footprints, isolated dinosaur footprints, a human finger, and a man-made artifact, all found in the same layer. This means that man and dinosaur did live at the same time. Did man live at the time of the dinosaurs? Or is it possible that dinosaurs still exist today? In recent times, there have been many reports of living pterodactyls. In the early 1970s, there was a pterodactyl uh, flap, if you will, that took place uh, around Brownsville, Texas. I was approached by an aeronautics engineer 
who stated to me that he had seen a living pterodactyl. He was within 50 feet of a creature, and he described him vividly. Uh, the creature was on the ground when he first saw him, became airborne, and then flew out of the sight. And he was, again, within 50 feet of this aeronautics engineer. He described him as having a beak, a crest, uh, leathery wings, hands on his wings, a tail, grayish brown in color. Now, the paleontologist in the audience will realize that this is a description of a rampharynchid pterodactyl. And according to standard evolutionary interpretation, these creatures saw their demise 225 million years ago. We had here multiple sightings including school teachers and uh, policemen of what they described as flying, giant flying lizards, pterodactyls, flying in the daytime even, which is unusual for pterodactyls because they tend to be apparently a nocturnal type of animal. And these pterodactyls flying along the Rio Grande. Their favorite food is decaying human flesh. And literally some of their funerals have been interrupted by these creatures trying to steal the corpse out of the casket. Now, these are very vivid descriptions. Some of the most interesting and credible reports come out of Namibia, a remote country in southwest Africa that's mostly desert. In Namibia, people whom I trust have reported to me that there is an area where a breeding population of pterodactyls still exists today. There is no way that you can account for creatures such as this being alive today and have 225 million years of time involved. Uh, creatures like Mokelium bimbi of the Congo that are matched specifically by the description of a quadrupedal dinosaur such as Brachiosaurus with a large body, long tail, long neck, and small head, uh, having been described by the nationals in the Congo within recent years. Finding creatures like this or the possibility of having creatures alive like this today means that the time has to be compressed drastically. And we're not talking about those millions of years of evolutionary time. How can we explain evidence of man and dinosaurs living at the same time? The theory of cataclysmic geology suggests that the Earth could be much younger than we think throwing into question our whole system of dating. It's often said that the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. You might ask, uh, well, is this a scientific fact? The truth is, this is not a scientific fact. This is a theory, a scientific theory, and one based on the uniformitarian dating of geological strata. The kind of geology we're taught today is a geology called uniformitarian geology. And this is the school of geology which tells us that geological change is very slow. It happens over millions of years. We can see the kind of changes. And therefore, when we have layers of strata, we then create a, a period of time that's vast in scope, covering millions and millions of years. Yet the same strata in the opposing theory of geology which is called cataclysmic geology, that same strata can build up not over millions of years, but in just a few years, or even in a matter of days. Fossils then, and the geological strata that we, we find them, are simply assumed to have accumulated over millions and millions of years. When animals die in a natural setting, they do not become fossils. A good example of this would be in the early 1800s, Buffalo Bill and his buddies went out to the Great Plains of America and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of buffalo, cut their tongues out and left them on the Great Plains to rot and die. Oh, they're already dead. What happened to those buffalo? Did any of those buffalo ever become a fossil? No. Not one will ever be a fossil. And that is because when, when things die, they decay and go to dust. And when you bury a dog in your backyard, he's not going to become a fossil either. 
What it takes to have a fossil, whether it's a dinosaur fossil or a petrified wood or anything like this, we've got to have some cataclysmic event that has not only killed that animal, but buried it under tons of gravel or volcanic ash or dirt in some landslide. The very mechanism that causes and creates fossils is the same mechanism that causes the extinction of these animals. And that is cataclysmic changes. So as we look at fossils, we start to see that they themselves are indicative of these cataclysms of the past. And now we can also begin to look at geological dating in a different way. On the face of it, um, an artifact, a human artifact, found in a layer of rock which seems to be millions of years old is an inexplicable anomaly. It's not so inexplicable if the strata isn't millions of years old and if the dating method that's being used is in fact inaccurate. And I suspect that in many cases that's exactly what has happened in recent years. The chief radioactive dating method that's used to date the Earth is the uranium-lead method. Uranium radioactive mineral turns into lead over a long, long period of time. You measure the amount of uranium in the Earth's crust, you measure the amount of lead. That tells you, or that at least conventional scientists say, that tells you how old the Earth is. Now, the figure that you arrive at when you use that technique is 4,500 million years. However, what they haven't mentioned is that uranium also turns into another substance. It turns into a distinctive form of helium, radioactive helium. In fact, practically all the radioactive helium in the Earth's atmosphere has come from radioactive decay. Now, if this method was reliable, if you measured the age of the helium in the atmosphere, it would give you the same age, 4,500 billion years. In fact, it doesn't give you an age anything like that. It gives you an age just a couple of hundred thousand years. Now, it seems to me that any technique for dating, which on one hand gives you an age of four and a half billion years, but on the other hand gives you an age of just a couple of hundred thousand years, that technique has to be at least very unreliable. The dating anomalies and the evidence which contradicts uh, the reliability of dating is being ignored by scientists on the whole because they'd have to restructure their whole theory of the age of the Earth. It would mean really starting from scratch. For example, the rate at which coal is formed is still controversial. The conventional idea is that coal is formed very slowly over millions of years and that basically it's age that determines the formation of coal. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence in the field that coal might be produced from wood by pressure alone. For example, uh, modern timber pilings and bridges have turned into a, a low rank of coal. Um, the Ohio, Ohio coal seam in the United States, the rank of the coal increases as you get, as the coal goes further and further underground, as the pressure increases. So it seems that there is some evidence that pressure alone might generate coal in a relatively short space of time. Now, if coal can be produced relatively rapidly, what about the other rocks of the Earth's crust? Perhaps they could be formed relatively rapidly as well. This is complete heresy. This is one thing that orthodox geologists would not accept. And yet there is mounting evidence that some types of rock can be formed very quickly in catastrophic conditions. The rocks behind me are thought to be 65 million years old, and they're thought to have been formed by processes that work very, very slowly over immense periods of time. But they could equally have been formed relatively rapidly by cataclysmic processes. Darwinists prefer the first interpretation because it's consistent with their interpretation of immense antiquity for life on Earth. The Earth could conceivably be younger than the four and a half billion years that it's customarily taken to be. And if that's the case, then there has been much less time available for life to evolve on Earth. And the Darwinian mechanism, which requires billions of years to work, is looking far less probable. The theory of evolution is so popular today that few dare to question it. In one sense, you can understand people's reluctance to drop Darwinism because apart from the fact that it's an attractive theory, there is also a scientific principle. It's called the principle of tenacity, that you shouldn't junk ideas just because a few anomalies have come along. The trouble is that the anomalies with Darwinism are so enormous that they're now greater than the theory itself. And so we should start questioning this principle of tenacity. We should start questioning, should we be hanging on to this theory regardless? 
The key problems with Darwin's theory are that, quite simply, there isn't any really solid empirical evidence. It's conjecture on conjecture, supposition on supposition. They're all very plausible, they're very rational suppositions, very rational conjectures, but they are still conjectures. And I find it ironic that for most of this century, Darwinists have acted and spoken as if they had already delivered conclusive proof to us of their theory. Well, in fact, that's the last thing they've done. There is no conclusive evidence of Darwinism. The evidence seems solid, but as soon as you start to investigate it, it just melts away. Probably the most famous example is the, the, the peppered moth. This is a light-coloured moth which uh, lives in the northern counties of England and between the years 1850 and 1900, when the trees were darkened by atmospheric pollution from factory chimneys, the moth changed from a light grey colour to a dark grey colour so that it could remain camouflaged on the tree trunks because the birds eat the moth. Well, this was described, this process, it's even been given a, a name by Darwin, this is called industrial melanism, and it was described by the director of the Natural History Museum, Sir Gavin de Beer, as being an example of evolution and even of natural, history, natural selection taking place in man's lifetime. And obviously, if that were true, it would be very powerful evidence. Well, when you look at the peppered moth, you don't need to be a scientist to be able to see that what's happened is that originally you had a lot of light-coloured moths and a few dark-coloured moths, that the light-coloured moths have died off because the trees have turned dark, and that the dark-coloured moths have flourished at their expense. Now, if Darwinists want to call that natural selection, they're entitled to do so. But nobody could possibly believe that that is a mechanism that could explain how one species could turn into another species, and that is what evolution is all about not about moths changing colour. One of the fundamental premises of Darwin's theory is that a species can, if it evolves long enough, turn into another species. Now this central idea is contradicted by every single plant and animal breeding experiment of the last 500 years. Every animal and plant breeder knows that there is a limit to the extent to which an animal or a plant can be changed. Ultimately, the line becomes sterile or it simply reverts to the original type from which you've selected. This has even been given a name. Ernst Mayer, professor of zoology at Harvard, called it genetic homeostasis. And that simply means that there is a barrier beyond which evolution cannot pass. And I find it extraordinary that the world's biologists continue to believe in the infinite plasticity of individuals when they know perfectly well that experiments show that it simply can't happen. In the first edition of his book, On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin made a very interesting observation. He said that he could see no difficulty in a race of bears taking to the water, becoming aquatic, and eventually becoming a creature, as he said, as monstrous as a whale. So there you have the idea, bears can turn into whales just given enough time and enough natural selection. Now, in later editions of his book, Darwin removed that claim. He'd obviously thought better of it and realized it couldn't be substantiated with evidence, so he thought he'd better not press it. But the interesting thing about him removing that is that the idea that a bear can turn into a whale through natural selection is the very core idea of Darwinism. It's the, it's the top and bottom of the Darwinian theory that one species can turn into another species. And in removing that example, I can't help feeling that Darwin must have had grave reservations about the rest of his theory. The whole Earth's surface is covered with sedimentary rocks, and in those rocks there are fossils. It ought to be possible to go to those rocks and to find a sequence of fossils, one species turning into another species, turning into another species. In fact, it ought to be possible for the kids at the local kindergarten to do this on an afternoon's nature study at the local quarry. But the world's greatest paleontologists, with the resources of the world's greatest universities at their disposal, have failed to do this, and they've been looking for more than 100 years. The theory of man's rise to civilization is as mysterious as his origins. Ancient monuments around the world were built with such sophistication that they can hardly be duplicated today. Yet scientists continue to belittle these remarkable achievements. I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods because I wasn't satisfied with the answers that were being given to me to a huge series of mysteries around this planet. Most mysterious of all, a series of ancient sites uh, that have never been properly explained by historians. These sites I think of literally as the fingerprints of the gods, as 
marks left on our planet by a lost civilization that we have not yet properly identified. And amongst those sites, two in particular are extremely interesting. One is Giza in Egypt, where the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx sand stand. And on the other side of the Atlantic, on the other side of the world, is Tiwanaku in the high Andes in Bolivia. In Tiwanaku, archaeologists have been surprised by the discovery of small metal clamps used to hold stones in place. Amazingly, these clamps were made from molten metal, poured into small molds carved in the ancient stone. But nearby lies evidence of an even greater feat of technology. One of the most interesting things that has been found at the site have been what appear to be large stone molds. Apparently, they were pour pouring molten metal into these molds. This would be the pour hole, and you'd pour your molten metal in and fill it up. If it is a mold, then it's quite different from anything else we've seen in the Americas, and it would imply a far greater technology than we believed that they had at that time. We're talking about gallons of molten metal at a time, which indicates a high uh, technology in the ability to utilize this molten metal in a mass amount. All that we know about the people who built these monuments is what we can deduce from the monuments themselves. And if we look at these monuments with open minds and open eyes, we find something very interesting. Firstly, that the level of technology involved in creating them was high, the lifting and maneuvering of these huge blocks of stone. And secondly, that they incorporated fantastically accurate astronomical alignments, which could only have been the result of a very accurate observational science. So this is what the monuments tell us. They tell us that the people who built them were serious and intelligent people with a scientific outlook on life. The ability of his mind to comprehend the very things that we comprehend today is there. He is us, and we are belittling him by making him less because we have decided that, oh, this was his limitation, and we're belittling him because he was just as um, fervently intelligent as we are today, and that's obvious from the technology involved. Civilization is not this linear progression. It's a roller coaster of peaks and valleys, of ages of science and enlightenment and the sudden dark age and collapse of civilization. The question would be, how far back in time does our roller coaster of history go? To find out how old an ancient civilization might be, archaeologists look to the monuments they left behind. But how do archaeologists determine when an ancient monument was built? One of the most used tools in archaeology is dating with carbon-14. Carbon-14 is very good for dating bone or charcoal, but doesn't work at all on dating stone. So when you go to a site and you find in association with the stone which you wish to date, some carbon, such as a campfire site, and you date that carbon, you will get a date. But that date does not date the stone, it dates the campfire site. Now, was that campfire made by people who built the site, or was it made by people who later came to the site? Since we cannot rely completely upon the dating of the artifacts associated with the site, then we must look at the construction of the site itself. And the ancients constructed this site with astronomical alignments in mind. And we can use those astronomical alignments to date the site today. The first thing that one realizes when you look at the pyramids of Giza is that they're designed along astronomical principles. This is extremely obvious simply because the base of the pyramid, for example, the square base faces, each side faces one of the cardinal points, east, west, north, and south, precisely. The precision is incredible. 
So it's clear that we're dealing with people who had astronomy in their mind. And we realize this very, very quickly when we look at the texts. Their texts are really astronomical allegories. They speak of going to the stars, they speak of the sun, they speak of the moon, they speak everything to do with the sky. So we have to follow that with the science of astronomy. And the logic is to understand what precisely are they trying to tell us with this kind of architectural precision. And the breakthrough came, the first breakthrough came, when it was discovered that there was a shaft within the Great Pyramid pointing to the belt of Orion. So now we had a very clear link between the Giza Necropolis and the belt of Orion. And that link, we understood it because the constellation of Orion was identified to the god of resurrection, Osiris. So this was the first breakthrough. The second breakthrough was to realize that the configuration of the three stars in Orion's belt were exactly the same as the configuration of the three pyramids of Giza. With that in mind, we had to carry on following the lead that they were giving us. And one of the major leads is that their whole effort, everything we know about pharaonic theocracy, their cult, the religion, the decrees of the king, everything they did was focused on what they called the first time, the time when their civilization began. So the next step was to see when was the beginning of the Orion cycle, and we used precession. We found out that it was in 10,500 BC. This led us to consider the whole arrangement of the sky in 10,500 BC, and we came with this absolutely amazing correlation. We found out that it was exactly at this time that the sun would rise at the vernal equinox. When we looked in that direction, we began to realize that they were drawing our attention to the direction of the alignment of the Sphinx. We have a Sphinx looking directly due east. And that is the big mystery. What does the Sphinx represent? Immediately we realized that the vernal equinox in 10,500 BC was the beginning of the age of Leo. So whether we like it or not, the science of astronomy is leading us to conclude that the Sphinx was carved in the 11th millennium. And we have to deal with that. Many ancient cultures are said to have been destroyed by cataclysmic events. Could these events be explained by the theory of crustal displacement? The Egyptians themselves tell us that their creation, their beginning, occurred after a great cataclysmic flood. Their land emerged from the waters. This date matches very well with the end of the Ice Age. It is very likely that we're looking at a civilization that has emerged from some great cataclysmic event, which in this case is probably a flood. In my opinion, this whole mystery is closely tied up and interwoven with the mystery of the last ice age, and it really is a huge mystery. Everybody knows, we all learn it at school, that there was such a thing as an ice age. And uh, it's very clearly established in the geological record that, for example, North America was covered with ice more than two miles thick, as far south as the Mississippi Delta, almost into the tropics. This ice was stable for more than 50,000 years. And then suddenly, and relatively recently, 15,000 years ago approximately, it all started to melt. And within just 2,000 years, that enormous mass of ice had completely melted down. Sea levels went up four or 500 feet around the world. No geologist has ever been able to explain why this happened, why the Ice Age ended so suddenly. But perhaps the answer lies in the theory of Earth crust displacement. Perhaps the reason that North America was covered with that mass of ice was because at that time it was situated much more closely to the North Pole than it is today. It was then shifted south into warmer latitudes by a displacement of the crust, and that would explain, naturally, why all that ice melted so rapidly, because it was in a much warmer climate. In the early 1990s, some uh, scientists from Australia uh, discovered some beech trees uh, 200 miles from the South Pole, which they dated to be two to three million years old. That is totally 
un not understandable under our current assumptions about geology. Our current assumptions about geology would say that uh, to move a continent like Antarctica to a place where it could produce beech trees would require 50, 60 million years. Now these are only two to three million years. So what we're, we're facing here is the need for another uh, geological theory that could move a continent the size of Antarctica to temperate zone under two million years. And that's where we believe the theory of earth crust displacement comes in. If there was an earth crust displacement destroying most of the earth's population, what happened to the survivors? After the earth crust displacement, some areas are completely unhabitable. They go into the, the frozen uh, polar zones and nobody can survive there. However, there are some areas where people can survive. Uh, they tend to be in the highlands because uh, people are afraid of, of staying in the lowlands where the tidal waves are, are devastating the, the, the shores. But in these uh, particular areas that we can isolate using the theory of uh, earth crust displacement, um, we have oases of survival, and it's precisely in those locations that we find the earliest and most important crops. And it happens not just in one area, but all around the world. It's happening in South America, it's happening in Central America, it's happening in Africa, it's happening in the Middle East, it's happening in Asia, and it's all happening around that time. There's nothing that's really much older, but suddenly, uh, after what we believe to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, of living by hunting and gathering, uh, suddenly we begin to experiment with agriculture. It seems to me that all of this is much more than coincidence. Uh, we believe that an advanced civilization was destroyed. The survivors who had knowledge of agriculture brought that knowledge to the inhabitants of the local areas that were happened to be ecologically stable and suitable for, for agriculture. And they brought that knowledge and they introduced it. And from that, we ultimately got the rebirth of civilization. It's pretty clear to me from the evidence that a common legacy of architectural knowledge was passed down from remote prehistory and spread out in very widely scattered locations around the world. Ask yourself this. If you belonged to a high civilization that had just been almost completely obliterated by a gigantic geological cataclysm, a movement of the crust of the earth, what would you set out to do in the future? First of all, you would set out to create buildings that were extremely stable, that would survive the worst imaginable earthquake. And that's what we find in these fingerprints of a lost architectural knowledge all around the world. A fixation, a desire to create buildings that would last forever, no matter what happened to them. And another thing that we find is a focus on trying to predict when the cataclysm will recur. What has come down to us from the ancient past seems to be a message that by a close study of astronomical phenomena, it is possible to predict when the Earth will again be visited by this all-destroying cataclysm. If evolution fails to explain man's origins, then what is the answer to how we came to be? For many, the answer is found with a supreme being. For others, the answer may be found on another planet. I did my graduate work at Stanford and got a master's degree in communications in which I focused on science, medicine, and the environment in school. All my work in doing documentary films was in the <coughs> Stanford Medical Center and the Stanford Linear Accelerator. So when I graduated and I went on into television and production and news, all of my beats were science, medicine, and the environment. And it was in that context, in the fall of 1979, when there were reports in Canada and the United States and other parts of the world, including Australia, that animals, usually cattle, but ranging through every domestic animal, uh, were being found with strange bloodless excisions that always seem to have kind of the same pattern from animal to animal. And I naively at the time thought, I will get to the bottom of this animal mutilation mystery. I was working on a documentary for Home Box Office, and a meeting had been set up and arranged by a lawyer in the East Coast 
with an Air Force Office of Special Investigations agent named Richard C. Doty at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Kirtland is one of the United States' major weapons technology development uh, military bases. It is surrounded by very high-tech uh, laboratory and uh, high technology development, a very critical area in our country. When we went up the steps and into the doors, there were several sets of doors. We went through an outer door, then we went through another set of doors. You had to check in at the desk. Then you went into a set of doors where he had to hit punch locks. And as we came into the office to sit down, one of the first things he said to me was, that documentary you did, referring to A Strange Harvest, upset some people in Washington. They don't want animal mutilations and UFOs connected together in the public's mind. And I remember being surprised that he was reinforcing the veracity of this film that I had done. And then another surprising moment came when he reached into a drawer and he took out an envelope that had no markings on it. And as he reached in to pull out about a dozen pages of white paper, he said, my superiors have asked me to show this to you. You can read this. You cannot take notes, and I want you to move from the chair you're sitting in to that chair. And he motioned to a big chair sitting almost in the middle of the room. And as I looked at the top of what he was handing to me, it was all cap centered on a page with no date, however, and no uh, official stamp. But it did say, briefing paper for the President of the United States of America on identified aerial vehicles. And wondering, why is this happening? Why is he handing me this? Why am I being made to sit in a chair in the middle of the room? And learning much later was so that they could videotape and audiotape my reactions to what I was reading. I began to turn the pages. And it began with a dry summary of multiple crashes of disks in the retrieval of bodies that were described as both dead and alive. And in the description on the live being, it went into several paragraphs about how an American military man had made a decision to stay with this live, it was called an extraterrestrial in the paper. It was also identified as an extraterrestrial biological entity, which the acronym was EBE, or EBA, as this man referred to it. The Air Force man staying with this extraterrestrial from 1949, according to this paper I was shown, until June 18, 1952, when the being died of unknown causes, we, the United States government, according to this paper, learned a great deal about its civilization and that relationship of that civilization to our planet. And one paragraph that stunned me when I read it, and I can almost remember it verbatim. These extraterrestrials manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. And this was further reinforced on the last page in the series of project names having to do with our government's research, following up whatever had been communicated from what they are calling extraterrestrials. It said, all questions and mysteries about the evolution of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered in this project is closed. And I remember reading that sentence three or four or five times after having read the other sentence about the manipulation of DNA in already evolving primates. Does that mean that they would take a woman, go in, get with some sort of an instrument, take out an egg as has been described by abductees, put it in some kind of a machine, mix it up with some kind of extraterrestrial DNA? Does it mean the old Bible, the Old Testament description, the time when the gods found the daughters of men fair and appeared to come and to commingle at night? Is that the way it was done? I don't know. A lot of people say, do you really believe that there are extraterrestrials? Well, the word believe should not be an operational word in any of this discussion because 
I feel that you have to give deference to eyewitness testimony. And there have been eyewitnesses around the world for at least 40 to 50 years in multiple countries who have been describing almost the same type of creature. All of these people in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Central America, South America, Australia, the Canary Islands, up the coast of Africa, and now almost every uh, country in Europe, they cannot, all of them, be making up a story for 40-some years around the world of seeing the same type of what is described as a non-human creature, whether it's associated with animals or whether it's associated with beams of light and the abduction syndrome, something is interacting with our planet and the government has told me anyway that we do have knowledge of extraterrestrials. If any of this government documentation is real, that some sort of an extraterrestrial non-human intelligence so sophisticated that it could take evolving primates and manipulate DNA and create us is absolutely true. If that is true, probably a good part of the population on the planet would resist it and deny it because it goes against the grain of what we have been taught. And in realizing that and having to speak in the public and produce books and documentaries, respecting the fact that we in the human family have been so ingrained that we are a natural evolutionary life on this planet, how do I, how do any of us deal with the possibility that we are something other, and that another life form could have provoked our creation. If the math on the pages suddenly becomes a reality, human life on this earth will change for all time. The planet will never, ever again be as we have known the planet to be. That's why it's a huge revolution. Once we finally, as a globe, say to everyone with CNN and all networks, we're not alone, ladies and gentlemen. Here's extraterrestrial A, B, C, D, E. There are planetary systems throughout this universe. There are galaxies filled with life. Then an entire new ocean, it's the biggest frontier, opens up in front of us. And rather than be afraid of it, I think we ought to go forward with courage.